the morning puja. It's a time to reflect on the Buddha Dhamma Sangha, the three refuges of the Buddhist. They're the traditional uh, introduction of offering candles, incense, and flowers is a, these are offerings made at a Buddhist shrine in any Buddhist temple, uh, at least in Theravadan countries. Flowers always represent uh, their symbol for sila, or morality. You notice on Buddha images that Buddha is always sitting on uh, some uh, lotus petals, which means a symbolically foundation for moral purity. And then the uh, incense, symbolic of samadhi, or the kind of um, balance of emotions and the equanimous heart <clears throat> in which the fire of wisdom is supported so that the candles uh, represent the symbolically wisdom or light then the offering of these is a is an act of giving. Some, uh, these, partic- these three kinds of things are uh, most anyone can afford to offer at some time or another. Then they reflect on the qualities of the Buddha characteristics of the Buddha. And of course these are like the the Arahant, the perfected one, the Bhagavan, the the, uh, purified one, the Sambuddha, the self-enlightened one. So these uh, particular descriptions of purity and perfection and some uh, some Buddha meaning through one's own efforts not uh, <coughs> depending upon some outside force for enlightenment but this Buddha is even though we, people seem to regard this as the qualities of a sage of the past and go to Mother Buddha, we have to see that all these symbols, concepts, historical sages included, all these conventional forms are just uh, pointing at the immediacy of the moment now. Not uh, just, we're not just reciting some historical record qualities of somebody who's dead and uh, Worshipping or paying respect to to um, someone who died 2,500 years ago in India, we don't even who is never known, who seems to be uh, someone remote in time and in place, in civilization. But these very qualities, these very characteristics of purity, perfection, and self knowledge. or the, what we say, taking refuge in the Buddha at this moment. The other, vichajarana sampano, means perfect in knowledge and conduct. Now this is, means that Buddhas, um, there's not any discrepancy between what they say and what they do. They're not uh, saying one thing and then doing another. 
Now these it's very common it the seemingly wise people will give off wise uh, wisdom, advice, and yet uh, they themselves, their lives are not uh, vichajalana sampano, they're not impeccable in their own lives. <coughs> they still, their conduct is not up to the standard of what they're saying. And the quality of loka vitu means the knower of the world, the seer. Loka vitu is a, a characteristic of a Buddha. And uh, as I was saying yesterday, what is it that Buddhas know that unenlightened beings don't know? Buddhas know that anything that arises passes away. Now the loka or the world is something that we tend to conceive as in very coarse terms probably from having taken geography lessons and looked at maps and globes so that to us oftentimes the world is a globe or continents, oceans, mountains <coughs> and so forth. But is that really the world? I mean, you think about it and you conceive the world as an idea in your mind. If you go out and look at the world, what do you see? You see an object of your eye consciousness. <clears throat> like this room here. This is, this is the real solid world here. I can touch it. I can hit it. But that in itself is in, is in the mind, isn't it? that uh, perception of solidity, that actually touching the form, the sense of solidity, to touch is a perception in the mind. All your views and opinions about the world is being round and a globe and with continents and so forth. These have come from the mind of human beings. In other words, the world is, is the mind rather than a lump of earth matter spinning around the sun. So the loka we do is the knower of the mind rather than a Buddha. And nothing in the suttas in the Pali Canon where the Buddha uh, even <coughs> mentioned the United States of America or North America or Australia and that they, they say he's loka widu didn't even mention China or Japan so the Buddha being that Seer or the know of the world means knowing the mind. Now the conditions of the mind, all that is common to the, or the characteristic that is common to all those conditions is that they arise and pass away. Even the sense of solidity, the, the ideas of, the, of a round, of a, of a spherical earth, ideas of space and time, these are in the mind. They come and go. So Buddhas know this. They're not deluded by the qualities of the conditions of perception. No longer uh, fascinated nor uh, averse, but knowing a simple truth that all that arises passes away. Then the characteristic, the quality of anutaro bodhisattva masarati santa tewa manusanang. This is the Buddha, is that which is capable of training gods and men. And 
in this way of speaking, gods and men represent intelligent beings. In the, in the Buddhist cosmology, devas are like uh, highly intelligent beings. Now they could be, or even kings and noble uh, sages were called the devas in Pali. But also it refers to, uh, say, invisible celestial beings, which are, are virtuous and good and have intelligence. And to manusya, which are human beings, which have the animal form, the animal senses, but the intelligence. Now this human intelligence is, or this intelligence of the human being, is the ability to reflect on, to observe. Like, even though your body is an animal's body, your body, we share the animal world, we share our consciousness very much with animals, the sensory consciousness. We can see them, they can see us, and we have the same kind of body, a physical body that experiences pain and pleasure, heat and cold, just as uh, all animals have this in common. But the animal world can't reflect on itself at all. It can't take, uh, if you teach, uh, try to teach a cat about morality, about not killing anything, it's, uh, no results yet, as I have this cat, it jitters. I've been teaching morality to now for four years. Even though she's met great teachers like Mahathi Sayadaw and Ajahn Chah, <laughs> living in with virtuous monks, lay people, she still insists on killing rabbits and mice an inability to reflect on. But a human being can do this. We can uh, look at this, these uh, things, what is right, what is wrong. So the Buddha is the trainer of gods and men. This means that this, this Buddha wisdom, that which knows that all that arises passes away, that very knowing, wisdom is the way that we are trained to break through the illusions of the human form of the even the intelligence the human intelligence or the deva intelligence because human beings have the animal form but the intelligence of the gods So our particular dilemma in 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 this in in birth as a human being is how do we relate the coarse body with the refinement of our consciousness? And mentally, we'd like to soar up into space. We're trying to do it physically now because we we just can soar up into outer space. We always want to go up. Nobody wants to go down. You know, going up to heaven, you never go down to heaven. You go down to hell. Hell is supposed to be under the ground. And so we have this, this desire to soar out. The mental uh, faculty is seeking to be liberated from the coarse physical limitations. And if you notice how much we resist the, the body itself, its heaviness, its limitations, we, we really resent. We don't like to, to be bound, earthbound, stuck on the ground with, a, with an animal's body. But this particular 
uh, problem of uh, human birth also has its advantages. In the fact that the gods or the devas they uh, experience so much happiness that they can never really really uh, understand the full meaning of the Four Noble Truths, suffering, origin, cessation, and path. Whereas a human being, the amount that we experience uh, a goodly amount of suffering, this physical pain, aging, physical aging, sickness and uh, death of the body, discontentment in the mind, now, because of that, the, the uh, Buddha is a teacher of men, and he established his teaching of the Four Noble Truths as a way of, of teaching human beings, so that those who were willing to, say, observe, wake up, be mindful, would, be, would see the way of liberation, the path, out of the cycle of birth and death. Now, in taking refuge in the Buddha right, in the morning, it's a way of, of remembering this. We forget all the time. We have very good memories, and we also are very good at forgetting. And so we we get carried away with our enthusiasm or ideas or depressions and doubts. So we need kind of symbols, ceremonies, conventional forms in which we can recollect. And so the beginning of a day like this is a way of recollecting, starting at the beginning of a new day. What happened yesterday is over, is only a memory. The rest of this day is the unknown, the future. Here and now, we're, it's, the, it's the early morning, and we're sitting here with, a, with this opportunity to recollect the Buddha. Now, the, also the recollection of the Buddha, we can also reflect on the Gotama, the Buddha, who was uh, a very, in, indeed a very wise and admirable being. Because this, uh, this sage in India uh, broke through the illusions of the body and mind, and then spent the rest of his life establishing a teaching and a tradition which would be carried through a span of time. Now, there's also Buddhas before Gotama who didn't establish their teachings, but who were enlightened Buddhas. And so their teachings never lasted very long. They were forgotten after the, generally after the the sage himself, the master, died, then the, there was nothing to carry it on through the span of time. And the Shakyamuni Buddha was, the, was noted as the Buddha that established the Four Noble Truths, Eightfold Path, and the Sangha that would be carried through a 5,000 year span. Now, that's a pretty clever thing to do, actually. <laughs> Seeing that it's still going, it's uh, even more amazing. I mean, imagine someone could say that 2,500 years ago. You could say, oh, this teaching will be carried through 5,000 years. Then, at this halfway mark now, we are still able to use this particular teaching in a country as remote in time and in place as, the, as this one. Uh, 
And yet the teaching itself is as clear and as precise and as useful to us as it no doubt was to those in India at that time. Now the Buddhist um, cosmology, Buddhist cosmology, this particular teaching is the way that a human being can, say, break through the delusions of the sensual world, can transcend uh, the conditions of birth and death, and attain the Nibbana, or the deathless, in this life, at this moment. Now this is, this is also a very uh, special kind of teaching because of that, because in religious experience, usually, uh, most religions only take you into the state of, of purity. Uh, but not liberation. So that, and this is what we mean by a Sama, some Buddha, because this means that through this, through putting forth this very effort to see clearly that anything that arises passes away, and through that, just that un- kind of understanding, <coughs> we are no longer bound by the conditions of the body, even though the body is still alive. It doesn't mean we, we, we throw the body away. But we understand that the body is not self. We understand that it's a condition in nature that has been born that will uh, get old and die. And the conditions of the mind that come and go and change. We realize like emotions, thoughts and memories, feelings, all these are just natural conditions changing and not self. So when you fully comprehend that through insight, then there's no more fear, no more desire. Uh, One no longer attaches or follows desire. Now, because this is a path of knowing rather than believing, you see, the important thing is the practice of it rather than believing anything. Uh, like in Buddhist, uh, in Buddhism, we never ask people to believe. They, what do Buddhists believe in? Well, there's no belief. There's nothing that one needs to believe in. It's um, a direct pointing at the way things are. Now, if you have to, a direct pointing means to look and see for yourself. But I know most of you believe in all kinds of things. <laughs> and your, uh, hab- your comic habits are to always believe or disbelieve things. Now, in this knowing, what can we know for sure without belief, believing in anything, without believing anybody's theory, without believing any doctrines by wise uh, sages, by great prophets? What can you, as just an ordinary human being, man or woman, uh, know without believing? Well, that's important, isn't it? Have you ever, have you ever thought about that? Or well, what can be known directly without believing in a theory? 
even a very good theory, a very wise theory, is still a, a belief. If we don't know the, the, the reality, And what we can know without believing is now at this moment the impermanent nature of this sensory consciousness. Whatever it is, whatever you're feeling now, whatever mental condition uh, is traversing your mind, that is a changing condition and is not self. So this is where the Buddha's path is, uh, is uh, this is where the, what the Buddha was pointing to very directly. To just know that much is, is enough. If you really understand, if you really know that, then there's no more problems in life. But the knowing is not a believing knowing. It's not a conceptual understanding either. You, know, you understand the concepts easily enough. But a constant knowing. In other words, a constant knowing mindfulness. When at the ta- in the suttas, when the sages, the Brahmins and the <coughs> philosophers of that age would go to the Buddha and ask, what is your teaching? You are the Buddha, the all-enlightened one. You must know everything. And they would ask him about God and does God exist? Do you believe in, in, the, in an eternal soul? Do you believe in in this or that. The Buddha would never answer these questions. He said, all I teach is suffering, it's arising, passing away, and, and the path, transcendent path. Now, that also is a very wise way of teaching. To not talk about that which is inconceivable. <clears throat> Not try to conceive the, con- uh, the inconceivable or limit the unlimited. <coughs> but a direct pointing is a way of seeing now limitations, uh, the conceived, the, that which is arising and passing the born, the originated, the created. Now that is knowing the, these, whatever those conditions are, whatever arises, passed away, no matter how important or how unimportant it is, that very knowing is enough. But to be able to be, to know in that way, we have to let go of our desire to know and our desire to annihilate and get rid of. We have to learn to be very patient, very humble, being content with knowing that at this moment whatever is arising, is, uh, whatever arises passes away. In other words, like just sitting here during the day, standing or walking, your intention for doing it, your feelings, your attachment, your opinions and views, the most sacred uh, concepts and ideas, all these things are just conditions arising and passing away. And as we constantly reflect on this, say, say on this, in this week a real opportunity 
to intensely observe this, reminding ourselves constantly. And just say the ordinary daily routine. Being that Buddha, being that very knowing, rather than sitting here for hours on end trying to become Buddhas. Uh, a lot of these ideas of modern times are you have to perfect the body, we have to we have to um, make this body perfectly healthy. We have to uh, have this some kind of perfect intelligence and emotional balance. Emphasis on trying to perfect that which is imperfect. On the level of the body and the conditions of the mind, is they're all unsatisfactory in the sense of dukkha. And this is a, one of the characteristics of existence. You'll not ever find perfection in any condition of the, of the sensual world because that is not where perfection is. We're spending our lives just trying to perfect an environment or a body or, a, or our mentality is really a waste of time. It only lead to despair. So knowing is knowing what perfection, where perfection is, what it is, rather than trying to find perfection in that which is imperfect. Trying to find the unlimited in the limited. Trying to find the inconceivable in the conceived. Trying to find the unborn in the born and the uncreated in the created is futile. So instead we place our attention on that which is unknowing, on the knowing now of the created, the born, the originated. And through that, observing that what is created is destroyed, what is born dies. What has an origin will cease. And in that knowing, then there's the liberation from any delusion in regards to any mortal condition whatsoever. Now the next reflection that we do is in uh, Buddhist countries we when we say we offer what is called punya or in the English translation is a very inspiring word but they usually refer to it as merit or grace or any good results anything that is good beneficial uh, good wishes, good thoughts, results from our practice, any kind of good results we get. Uh, this sharing of punya is a way of, say, opening out, of not just practicing meditation here for our, just for our own um, self, but also a, a reminder of that any goodness, any success that we might achieve, or attain, or accumulate in our lives to be shared uh, with all sentient beings. Now this kind of reflection also will uh, allow us to feel more responsible for how we live during the day here when you realize that, that you are not just some alienated, disconnected being that has no effect on the universe. Many people nowadays think how I live is, is nobody else's business because I can do what I want. U.S., where we stress individualism of doing what we want, living our lives for 
to perfect ourselves, to, to fulfill our desires, to do what we want to do. And no matter how it affects anyone else, our parents or friends or husband, wife, or the society we live in, we think, I want to fulfill myself, I don't care what happens to you. But the Buddhist always reflect the fact that our actions, the way we live, has its effect on the universe we live in. Not only on the immediate uh, beings around us, but on the whole universe. So that if we live a selfish, cruel, stupid life, it adds to the misery of all sentient beings. If we live a good, moral, virtuous life, it it's for the welfare of all sentient beings. It has its good effect on the universe. So this sharing of punya is a way of, say, a Buddhist way of praying, of, like for those we know who are ill or un unhappy, those that are suffering, way of praying for, say, um, those that we don't know who are suffering. But it's not just a prayer asking for God to help all those who are miserable and unhappy, but it's an actual offering of our own uh, goodness and a merit and grace as offering outward to, to develop that in our daily lives of good action virtuous living as an offering for the welfare of sentient beings. Those we know, say, such as our parents, friends and so forth, those, uh, uh, like in uh, Buddhist countries, they'll oftentimes, uh, uh, when somebody is ill, um, some mother, her child is ill, she'll come to the temple and offer food to the monk. As a, in order to share the merit with her sick child. <clears throat> it's a, it's a, that's why I say it's kind of a Buddhist prayer. But it's more of an active prayer than a passive one of a, asking for an outside source to do something. It, we take that opportunity ourselves to do something kind, and good, and generous in the world at that moment, offering that for the welfare of that sick person or for all sentient beings. Now this is an important kind of reflection. In Titus, we last year we dedicated the whole year, a whole merit of our our life as monks and meditators for the welfare of all sentient beings. So all of you were included in that. I hope that <laughs> I hope you noticed the improvement, Lavla. <laughs> like Master Hua in San Francisco said, San Francisco won't sink into the ocean as long as he's there. Mm -hmm. Hasn't sunk into the ocean yet either. <laughs> So at this time, it, this attitude of sharing, and when we live a good life and uh, practice the Dharma, that which is good in the universe accumulates around us. Grace, in Christianity they call it grace. When we open ourselves up to the truth, then grace uh, operates through us merit, and that which is good, and why it seeks to surround us. So rather than, than uh, say, developing the attitude of accumulating any of this for oneself, we always offer it to the welfare of all sentient beings, so our good actions and our mindful living is, is a benefit to all sentient beings. 
This is a, a devotional practice, obviously. So we reflect first on the uh, the monks. We always remember our preceptor or the monk that ordained us to share any merit, any grace from our life with our preceptor and with our teachers. And for all of you to reflect this moment, to share the, the grace or goodness, the good results or the happiness that you get from this with your teachers, those who have taught you the Dharma. And with our parents, a way of remembering our parents, of offering this goodness as to help or to bring happiness or liberation to our parents. And our relatives, husband, wife, brothers, sisters, children, good friends, all those that we feel positive about or we are, uh, feel love or some kind of relationship with, some kind of positive relationship. Now we can reflect on them using their names and And for the leaders of this country to offer the merit and the grace from our life, from our practice, for their welfare. The leaders of a country have to make important decisions that affect the lives of many millions of people. So our own virtuous action and wise living has its effect also on the, those who have to make those decisions. Better than trying to, what happens in America these days, we try to kill them. <laughs> Rather than shoot them. But the Buddhist <laughs> does, uh, refrains from that kind of action and offers the merit of his life, or her life, to, for their welfare. Whether we agree with their political point of view, what they're doing is not the point. We're not here taking political sides. But just that kind of compassion and love unbiased in which we say offer this merit to help them to make the right decisions, do the right thing. offering this punya for the welfare of those that we don't like, those that we know personally, who have hurt us, humiliated us, or caused us pain.
for all those beings who, uh, say, all animals, those animals that we like, our pets, cats and dogs, horses, all the animals that we like to eat, cows and pigs, chicken, and all, all sentient beings, all animals, birds and fish, wild and tame, insects, Then for the welfare of all uh, miserable beings that live in the states of constant fear and obsessive desire. They like those uh, drug addicts, alcoholics, people obsessed with desires of a low kind and have to spend their lives constantly seeking for gratification. all those in prisons, in prison camps, mental hospitals, so forth, offering this merit for their happiness, the way of, of at least remembering, re reflecting on the suffering of other beings that he, at this time, at this moment in time. And then the, all the malevolent evil forces in the universe, all those caught in hatred and desire to destroy, to share this merit with them. So in this practice of sharing of punya, it's, it's like a Buddhist prayer. It's a way of recognizing that we're all on this, in this world together, from the most ethereal to the most coarse, most angelic forms, the most evil forms. But how we, this, this person here, how I can live my life has its effect on all these beings. So when we really understand this, then we must, uh, at least I personally, feel more responsible for <clears throat> my own life. How I must live in this world.